The first question as we get things rolling here is what did we learn from Niners Cowboys other than the Niners own Dallas? Yeah. What did we learn from uh, from last night's win? Well, we could go granular and talk about particular players, and I'd love to. We can do that. I'm going to go big picture first. Yeah. Because to me, I think we learned a couple of things. The Niners still have a gear that they can kick themselves into that is pretty dominant. That third quarter was vintage 49ers. That was a standard we're used to. 21 nothing in 15 minutes. That's phenomenal. Great job. But I think at the same time, we've learned that this is a team that can't really maintain that standard for a full game. They don't close games. They don't play 60 minutes. They let teams back into it. So they still have that gear, but right now they're still searching for a complete game. Like they, that was a 15 minute performance. Yeah. I, I would say that um, we learned a lot of things. I thought, I mean, one, I think, Debo Samuel is still very much the 49ers ignition, even if they're going to, you know, maybe part ways from him in a year. I still think, you know, when the money's on the table, that's the guy who shows up. He had the touchdown called back. He had the big reception in the first half. If you go back to the Philly game, it was, you know, he had the big tunnel screen a year ago. He had the initial score. So I just think in the biggest moments, Debo Samuel is still the 49ers ignition. Um, I Kittle. learned, I, I mean, I think Kittle is the best 49er tight end of all time. Um, and I think he's, you know, proving that as we go. But I think Debo is more of the initial ignition. He's like, he's a tone setter. He sets the tone early in games. Um, I think we learned that Isaac Carendo continues to improve and really showed some game breaking ability in this game i mean he you look at him grant there's he's just on a different speed he's a different size different speed you know i mean he's he's got game breaking ability he can take it to the house i mean this guy's already slid down to avoid scoring multiple touchdowns um but you know shanahan said something in the post game he's like this guy learns off of every carry and i just feel like he's He's better now than he was initially. He's getting better by leaps and bounds. He's holding on to the football, even though he ran a, you know, he put the ball, he juggled a, a, a ball on the halfback toss in this game. But, you know, and he did run up the back of his offensive lineman and, and fall down on the first carry. So he's going to do that. He doesn't have natural running back instinct. But you know what? He's so big. He's so fast that if they can get him into that second level or, you know, in that third level and he's going up against DBs. Nobody wants any part of Garendo on the second or third level. He's just too big, too fast. I like Garendo. I want to come back to Kittle real quick. I like what you're saying about Debo, but to me, this has been very much Kittle season. He's leading the team in targets, catches, receiving yards, touchdowns, and first downs. Uh, at least he's leading receivers. He's hurt every week, and yeah. yet he finds a way to go out there and play like he's 26. He's having an incredible season. And you could argue he sort of carried him through the Christian McCaffrey list portion of the year. Debo's been very good as well. Nothing, not to take anything away from him, but it's not like Kyle Juszczyk stepped up or anything. Yeah, we're looking at you, Kyle. I think he had one of the lowest grades of anybody, actually. Juszczyk. Oh, yeah, that holding penalty. Right, the early holding penalty against Juszczyk. I mean, you could definitely go with Kittle as the ignition. I, I just think Kittle... Maybe I take Kittle for granted a little bit. I, I think that's one thing that's well, you call Debo the tone setter, and I would agree with that for sure. I know what you mean by that. He, he, there's a difference, and that's that's Debo. And I think early in the game, Kyle tries to go to Debo, get him involved, get the defense to account for him, and then Kittle's sort of like the counter or the changeup or the curveball, whatever you want to call. Well, I mean, I don't think the Cowboys can handle Kittle. I mean, there's no question. And, the, you know, we expected him to have a big game because their numbers against the tight end were bad. Um, but Kit and Kittle continues to play hurt. I mean, I asked him, I said, how are you feeling? He's like, I'm feeling better than I was feeling last year at the, at the, at the buy. <laughs> in other words, in other words, um, you know, I, I, I'm not feeling good, but I'll just come up with a time where I was feeling worse, but he's gotten it out. Um, I'll but tell you, you this. Do you remember what, what life was like for Gronkowski after about 29 years old? I mean, he was never yeah. really healthy. Oh, but these tight ends just get destroyed. Yeah, and Kittle plays a very similar style of football that Gronkowski did. So I think it's yeah. very commendable what he's doing. And you don't take it for granted because you never know when his body's just going to go. 
JP Mason, I think is it's safe to say he's not a hundred percent. Um, safe to say. Ricky Pearsall is definitely heating up and getting a little bit better every week. Uh, I thought this was Brock Purdy's best game as a runner, but once Agreed. again, he to me the one Purdy thing that's just frustrating is that he struggles to hold on to the football. He fumbled again on a pump fake. I mean, we've Thank seen God him. he held on to it on second and three on that final possession, man. That was the difference in the freaking game. Yeah. But I loved, you know, upon the rewatch, Purdy was incredible in this game as a runner. He made so many good plays as a runner in this game. He either bought, there was a couple times there was like, you know, there was obviously a busted play and he just took off running and, and ran for a first down. But there were other plays where he just bought time. I mean, he's just, he's a good runner. I mean, he's a, he, to me, that's the most underrated aspect of his game. You know, you don't think of Brock, you don't look at him and go, yeah, oh yeah, that guy's going to burn you with his legs. But he does. He does. And he knows when to run, how to run. Um, it's hard to stop. Was a, there was one play where they, they, I think they played man coverage, rushed three and had like a spy in the a gap, a D lineman and Purdy just gave him a quick head fake to one side, ran the other way. Like pff, you better have someone pretty athletic spying Brock Purdy. And if teams are going to play more man to man coverage against him, which is the way to go, not just against him, but against this personnel and scheme, he doesn't necessarily have the arm to dominate man to man coverage, but he has the legs. You play, you play two deep man under against him. You're asking for a 15 yard scramble. I'll tell you, I have, I, I won um, on my wagering last week, and one of the props that I I've been taking every week is take the over on the Brock Purdy rush total. Hell yeah! It's usually around eight yards to ten yards. I think it might have been eleven yards. Yeah, fifty last, last night. Fifty six. We had 56 oh, no. last night. Yeah, I mean that was easy. I mean, yeah. I mean, think about it this way: if they're going to play man, and they are, because he completes forty one percent against man, seventy three percent against zone, then it takes an incredible Run. defensive effort to keep him under twenty five rushing yards. I mean, you're just not going to do it. He's just going to run. He's going to find a time to run, uh, usually because the offensive line's not doing their job. But even if they are, he's going to take an avenue and he's going to take off and he's going to run. So and if he keeps gashing them, they won't play man coverage anymore. That'll yeah. stop it. Remember, people yeah, tried playing man-to-man -man coverage against Kaepernick. Packers tried playing man-to-man -man coverage against Kaepernick. He ran for 180 yards and however many touchdowns in a playoff game, and then he got a whole lot of zone after that. So, yeah, that's one way to make sure you don't see so much man-to-man -man coverage. And Kaepernick was different, though. I mean, he was a game breaker. I mean, he seriously, yes. you if you if he once he took off, he could take it to the house. He so, would destroy I mean, like tackle uh, angles like Mostert. You would think yeah. people would think yeah. they had him and he'd just run right by. And he's also tough. I mean, Kaepernick was way tougher than your average quarterback. So he didn't, he wasn't fearful. Um, and then on defense, we learned some things in this game. Sam Aquinu playing defensive tackle on passing downs, um, standing upright in the in the B gap, basically kind of recreating the Arden Key Niner NASCAR package. Um you know, I thought he was impressive. I mean, he has really played well. And to me, if there was one theme of this thing, it's that the youth on the defense is starting to really take off. The top four rated PFF Niner defenders, Renardo Green, Jair Brown, D. Winters, D. Molinor. I mean, all those guys are 24 or younger. I mean, that, that's pretty good. Um, the, the young DBs, especially Lenore, Renardo, Mustafa, even Luter made a nice tackle on special teams. Jair had a couple of really, really nice plays to me. The young Niner DBs are very impressive. Now they're not completely coached up and they're not without flaw or anything, but they're very impressive. And it's like, as the season goes on, it seems like some of the rosters getting tired, but those young DBs are not getting tired. They're getting better and better and better. I think you did a good job breaking down all the positives that we learned from this game. I want to go back to the big picture. It's yeah. as as many as many silver, not silver, they won as many positives as you can find. I still think an overall uh, writing theme from this one is they're just not that juggernaut team that they were last year. Last year, they played the Cowboys with Micah Parsons and just blew them out. And this game was trending the same direction. This game could have easily been 40 to 13 or something like that, 41 to 13, but that's not who this team is. At least not yet. The identity of this, the identity of this team is they let teams back into the game. 
And it's going to come down to the end. It's going to come down to the last few possessions when it shouldn't. And that's, I think, maybe Greenlaw and Christian McCaffrey change all that around. But uh, I think the, the Niners need to stop waiting for Christian to come back. It's 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 in it's it's in you guys. It's 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 not you can't ask him to be the savior. You guys outscored the Cowboys 21 nothing in the third quarter. It's within you. You just got to tap into it more consistently. Well, the question is why? I mean, you're right. There's no question. The second half, the negative in this game was once again the Niners in the second half on the defensive side can't seal the deal. They can't close. They can't finish. Um, so to me, I look at it as they've got some young DBs. So there's a little bit of inconsistency on the back end. They've got Campbell instead of Greenlaw on that second level. So there's a little bit more, too much room in the middle though. Campbell, I thought played his best game in this game. Um, but to me, the number one reason the Niners can't finish is they don't have a pass rush to finish. So the, you know, they can put a little heat. And they can come at you and they can try hard, but they don't have that overwhelming pass rush. And then they don't have good enough depth to spot Floyd in the moments they need him. So he's kind of worn out in the moments they need him. Um, so like to me, it's if they could add, I mean, if you're if you're looking at the rumors tied to the Niners, there's a lot of a lot of rumors tied to them connected to a defensive end or a defensive tackle. So I you know I know a lot of people have speculated Gary wide Smith. receiver. But it sounds like they're going D-line. It sounds like they're trying to add to their D-line. And I think they just look like they get into Prescott into an obvious second half passing situation when you know they're not going to run. They don't have much of a run game anyway. But now it's late in the second half. They have no, they're, they're two touchdowns down. They're coming with the pass. And yet the Niners can't they can't close the space on the back end. They can't they can't put any heat on the quarterback with any real consistency. So. I think they need another rusher or two, another D lineman or two. 